Supercomputers that Seymour designed had a tremendous impact on our everyday lives. The safety design of cars, crash testing, exploration for petroleum, certainly the design of uh, military aircraft, and then later the design of civilian aircraft were all areas in which supercomputers had a tremendous role. Welcome to the Chippewa Falls Museum of Industry and Technology. CFMIT is dedicated to the history of industries in Chippewa Falls and also to provide a showcase for current industries. In this video, you are going to learn about and hear from some of the people who played key roles in the history of supercomputers in Chippewa Falls. My name is Dave Frosch. I've been associated with one form or another of Cray since 1972. I, during most of that time, I was Corporate Secretary and Chief Net Technology Counsel. I held a similar position later with Cray, Inc., a successor company. As you will hear, Cray and Chippewa Falls took different corporate forms. From 1972 until 1996, Cray was Cray Research, Inc., a separate company. From 1996 until 2000, Cray operated as a division of Silicon Graphics. In, in 2000, Terra Supercomputing of Seattle bought the Cray assets and became Cray Inc. Cray Inc. continues to, to exist in Chippewa Falls. A significant part of the Cray story and the Cray history involves Seymour Cray himself. However, there were many other people who played key roles. Hello, my name is Jim Mondelaire. I'm a docent here at the Chippewa Falls Museum of Industry and Technology, and we're going to introduce the story of Seymour Cray in Chippewa Falls. Today we are at, at the exhibit that we have here at the museum. Seymour grew up on the west hill of, of uh, Chippewa Falls, and here he is on Dover Street. Seymour had a sister, Carol, and the two of them spent their summers on the upper end of Lake Lesota. When Seymour was 10, he built a device out of an erector set components that converted punched paper tape into Morse code signals. And that's the Morse code signal that we have on the wall there. He earned the Bausch and Lomb Science Award and taught physics after the teacher left for World War II. After graduation, he was repairing televisions to make ends meet. He looked up his college professor for a job lead and was told to check out the work going on at the unused World War II glider factory. He did, and engineering research associates hired him. While at Engineering Research Associates, he was designing computers to break codes for the government. In 1958, when ERA, then Remington Rand, decided to stop producing scientific computers, Seymour left the company and joined with several others in forming Control Data Corporation. Just a little bit of a background on myself. Uh, I was in the Navy from 1951 to 1955 and was fortunate enough to attend electronic school. When I was discharged from the Navy, I was looking around for work and I saw this ad in the little ad in the paper about a company called ERA that at that time was hiring engineers and technicians to work on computers. And I answered the ad and I was fortunate enough to get a job as an electronic technician working for Engineering Research Associates. At that time, they were making computers. While at Control Data, Seymour did not like the constant interruptions and interferences from salesmen. Therefore, he convinced Control Data to, uh, to build, set up a new laboratory in Chippewa Falls along the Chippewa River in 1962. The museum has Seymour's desk that he actually used at Control Data. What you see on the desk today is the Boolean algebra that Seymour generated to describe the computer. We also have a slide rule, which Seymour is very proficient at. And you also see the clock that was on the upper corner of the desk. And this was a mechanical clock that um, buzzed whenever it was running. You know, the powers that be in, Mini in, uh, yeah, in Minneapolis it decided that, you know, Seymour needed a secretary. He needed somebody to answer the phone. 
But I remember him saying to me, uh, would you call a meeting in the lunchroom? So I told everyone. And we went to the lunchroom at the time, and he stood up and uh, spoke what he had to say, very minimal amount. And he'd just turn around and, and walk out. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he was painfully shy, I would say that. Seymour's first computer at Control Data Corporation in the Twin Cities was the 1604, which was a 48-bit computer that had 32K of, of uh, magnetic core storage. Seymour's next computer at Control Data in the Twin Cities was the 160A, which was basically a scaled down from the architecture of the 1604. A friend of mine checked out one of these machines, loaded all of the diagnostic programs into the core storage, crated it up, delivered it to Cape Canaveral, took it out of the crate, plugged it into the wall, ran all the diagnostics, and the install was done. So it was, it was a very convenient, portable computer. This is your, your first laptop computer. And after delivery of the first systems, and work started rather quickly on a follow-on system, which was to be called the 8600. At the same time, Control Data was experiencing financial problems. And uh, one of the uh, efforts, I believe, to reduce costs was to perhaps cut back on the development costs of the 8600. Uh, that didn't set very well with Seymour because we had a, actually a very small budget and it was some time in that time period where Seymour felt that he would leave control data and start his own company. Started a company called Cray Research. That was in 1972 and development then rather quickly started on building a new machine that would have been significantly faster than what was available in the marketplace. And of course, that was the 7600, as well as some comp competitors from IBM and a couple, one or two other companies. And uh, the work that was started then was basically that of the Cray-1. So this is a Cray-1. In fact, it's Serial-1, the very first machine that was built by Cray Research. It's beautiful, it's iconic, and it turned the entire numerical computing world upside down. And there's one in the Smithsonian. So how did that happen? We also had advancements in, the, uh, we also had advancements in wiring and we were able to make wiring a lot smaller, and we were able to shrink the machine down. The thing that always comes to my mind about Chippewa Falls and Cray, particularly in the early days, are the people, mostly women, that put the Crays together. They, they wired them up. This is in the old days before microprocessors and all this microscopic uh, technology. Wiring on the first chassis, down at the little building down there and they brought that thing in and they laid it down and here was I know five million of these little blue and white wires hanging all down they said now you've got this crochet hook and you've got this book that tells you you pull from point A to point B you put a solder sleeve on it and you solder it together we're looking going oh my lord how are we ever going to do this I 
acquired Cray in 1996. So then in 2000, along came Terra Computer. And Terra Computer uh, purchased the Cray business from SGI. They purchased the, com the name from SGI and they changed the name of the company to Cray. This was very meaningful be because Cray was a name that was well known throughout the high performance or the supercomputer industry. At Cray Inc., the very first uh, system that Cray introduced, Cray Inc., I should say, introduced, and was a very successful system. I still work there today. It's, uh, you know, going on 38 plus 40 years, and it's still a great company. We hope you've enjoyed learning about the Seymour Cray collection at CFMIT in Chippewa Falls, and we certainly hope you have a chance to come and visit.